Thanksgiving holiday is upon us. I hope you enjoy it and have a blessed one with your friends and families. And we have market data, economic data, still maybe in our brains, maybe we'll give it a break for a moment at some point, but Eddie Gifford, CFP, Wealth Advisor over at Tactive, has a lot of this on his mind. And one thing in particular that you've watching in the markets is Bitcoin, and you have a big projection on your mind. Yeah, I mean, how could you not be talking about Bitcoin after we've seen what's happened to it, especially since the election? And it's interesting, you know, I, I really felt like we would see a pullback to around like 80,000 before, uh, you know, after we pulled back from almost 100,000. And maybe that still happens. But it's interesting because when you look at this thing and you, and you look at the cycles and you look at like what typically happens over a four year time period, if we're, we're, we're already tracking like very, very similarly to where we were in 2020. And if everything stays the same, guess what? Uh, Mid-February, late February, we could actually see 200,000, not 100,000, but 200,000. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of, uh, if you're willing to swing for the fences, it's a good play. But remember, uh, to go that far that fast, it's going to go up and down, and, and a 10% day is just normal. So uh, if, it's not definitely not for the faint of heart, that's for sure. Wow, down to 80,000, to 100,000, to 200,000. What will drive it? What will drive Bitcoin? And that's not that far away, February. Um, no, it's what will not. What drive it to that? Yeah, go ahead. Well, I think that it, I, basically what's going to happen at this point is uh, we have a lot of euphoria heading into the end of the year. We have a lot more adoption that's happening. We have a lot of confidence coming from uh, risk on assets in general. And, and then we have this thing called supply and demand. And when it comes to Bitcoin and you really start learning about it and reading about it and doing all of this stuff, uh, what you realize is that there is a finite number of coins. And so every single time that someone like BlackRock or Sailor buys Bitcoin, it's reducing the supply to a finite number of coins that's going to exist. And so the more that you start to realize that and understand that, the more that you're like, oh my gosh, this is a crazy supply and demand play, except you know, if, if everyone decides all of a sudden that Bitcoin is worthless. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the point. We've got all the big guns that are in it now. Uh, we've got a, a, a lot of people talking about it now. And as more and more and more people talk about it, more and more and more people adopt it. And as more and more and more people adopt it, we see these euphoric rises. Now, I'm not saying it ends the year next year at, at 200,000, but I definitely think that it could hit 200,000 in the first quarter uh, and then kind of probably just maintain around there. Um, but uh, a lot of it is just for lack of a better term, I feel like there's going to be a lot of FOMO and it's going to be running away and people are just going to keep buying and it's going to keep on going. Yeah, understood. And so you would use iBit, from what I understand, as one way to do this. And you have some other names like Tesla on your radar. Yeah, absolutely. If you're, you know, for uh, the Bitcoin play, uh, the ETFs are just easy. You can use iBit, you can use FBTC. For the for the people that even want more, they can use stuff like BTCL, which is a leveraged play. Uh, but on the other side of the coin, we just look at uh, what stocks look like they have promise heading into next year and then heading into the future in general. We definitely like Tesla. We've been talking about Tesla for the last couple of months. We felt like there uh, were, were, were a lot of potential uh, when there was a lot of potential wind that would be at the back of that stock. Of course, California doesn't want to give them uh, credits, but I, I don't think that Elon Musk really cares. Uh, he knows that he has a vision and he knows what he's building in the future. And uh, we're in this spot where there's just a, a lot of uh, confidence around Elon Musk. And, and if there's a lot of confidence around Elon Musk, there's going to be a lot of confidence behind Tesla. And so we think both short term and long term, uh, Tesla has still has a ton of upside. Yeah, you also have DoorDash and Atlassian, which of the ticker symbol is team. Tell me about those two names. I mean, I guess you're seeing at least 10% upside. You wouldn't make them picks otherwise, right? Oh, yeah. No, yeah, we're, we're seeing at least 10. I mean, we could see 20, 30% easy, and uh, especially when we're talking individual stocks. Like, that's the cool thing about the individual stocks, right? It's like market goes up 10, we could be up 30. That's the fun part. Of course, 
the reverse is also true. But when we look at DoorDash, I don't know about you, Nicole, but things are busy right now. It feels like I'm always being like pulled in like 18 different directions between the kids' activities and holidays and family in town and all these different things. And so anything that I can do to make my life a little bit easier right now, uh, I'm looking for that. And something like DoorDash actually does that for you because it just kind of takes that additional chore, so to speak, off your plate. So we do like DoorDash for the holiday season. We also like like it because there has been a, 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 a ton of steam behind it and it continues to head in a, in a positive tra trajectory. Of course, on the other side, we've got Atlassian and, and the thing about Atlassian is they help businesses become more efficient and more effective and uh, through a lot of their programs that they use and everything. So with the small cap trading uh, appearing to be back now, uh, we think this is good. You know, although Atlassian is not a small cap company, a lot of small cap companies could benefit from using the services offered by Atlassian. So we think that uh, there's a lot of good trajectory over the next 12, 24 months uh, with th that team over there. So uh, we're excited. We think that the the future is bright. Uh, of course, there are certain things that do stand out to us from the standpoint of we well, got the consumer spending, that's good, but PCE did just tick up and a lot of that spending, unfortunately, is debt. And so if that goes on too long, that could turn sour. Now, quickly, you were talking about things could get worse before they get better. You liked dollar cost averaging. You were mes you were mentioning that at least for the Bitcoin trade. Mm -hmm. um, is that sort of the premise of your big picture on how to invest in the next two months, 12 months, you know, et cetera? Yeah, I think that, I mean, right now, obviously, like the best thing that you can do is stick to whatever your plan is. Uh, we we operate under a, a multi-asset, multi-methodology uh, portfolio system. And so for us, anytime that we buy something, we have a predetermined reason to sell it. So we don't mind like going on today because we already know what we're going to sell it at in two weeks, three weeks, uh, six months for that matter. But on the flip side, if you're at home, you're doing it yourself, you're trying to figure out like, what do I need to do? Uh, that's where dollar cost averaging can make a ton of sense. We we definitely think that there's going to be a lot of change that comes with the next administration. And because of that change, that's probably going to drive volatility. Well, when volatility is occurring, it's your best friend if you're adding to your portfolio. So just keep adding, just keep staying consistent, uh, keep buying, keep buying, keep buying through all of that volatility. And you come out super happy on the other side. Yeah, we're going to have a, a home sector coming up. I mean, you were talking about some of the revisions that have been happening. We did have a dip briefly in rates, which did help some mortgage apps. But you did have, because we're going to have a, a conversation with the panel next. But I was, you know, wondering your big picture thought I can incorporate into the next, you know, conversation, too. Some of your thoughts on housing going forward? Yeah, housing is, unfortunately, housing is kind of in a rough spot. We've been talking about this for the last 12 months, probably, with clients, and just that rates are eventually going to catch up. And at some point, the people that need to resell, uh, they're going to have to take a lower price because the, the houses are significantly more expensive, one, because of prices, and two, because of rates. And and when you look at it from like that perspective, the fear is, well, that's going to continue to make it very, very difficult for the consumer, at least the, the new consumer who's coming to market, graduating from college. Now they want to buy a house. They want to start doing these things. So uh, the, I, I think that we are due for a correction next year uh, in real estate. I don't know if it's going to be six months, 12 months, uh, where, where we see like that 20 to 25 percent pullback. Uh, but if you are on the sidelines and you're thinking, hey, I really want to buy a house, uh, we're telling people right now, two to three years is probably the sweet spot based on history and, and based on kind of what's going on from a macro standpoint right now. So until the bond market starts to believe the Fed and rates start to come back down, uh, we're going to see some corrective actions occurring in the real estate market. Not a bad thing. We're due for it. Uh, and uh, that's okay. And so we just have to be mindful of that and be ready but when the opportunity is there, uh, then you can jump in, in in a year or two. Eddie Gifford, thank you for all of that. CFP over at Tactive. Appreciate it and happy Thanksgiving. Thanks. Appreciate Eddie. it. Thank you.